Thank you for joining us today for Fish and Richardson's litigation webinar series. My name is Jamie Partridge, and today my colleague, Christina Brown Marshall, and I will present Negotiation Ethics. The best thing about this course, besides um, there is some interesting material, is that you will receive ethics credit. Um, our biographies, the presentation, the New York, New Jersey blank CLA form are available for download on your control panel. Um, please note that you must be logged into the webinar on your device to receive CLE credit. You will not receive this ethics CLE credit for listening to the audio portion only. So during our webinar, which will run for one hour, um, we're going to quickly, to fairly briefly go through some of the guiding principles of negotiation ethics and what you should do uh, when you're negotiating a contract um, or an agreement. And we also want audience participation. So the part we really like about this presentation is where you guys give us feedback. We're going to have a polling. We're going to have some hypotheticals toward the end, and we're going to poll you and hopefully get some, not only your poll, your, your answers to some of our questions, but also your reasoning behind that. Also, we have a questions panel where you can ask questions throughout the presentation, and time permitting, we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. And also, you can always contact us personally. Uh, I have to say this next part. Um, we need to remind you that the content of this presentation is for educational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the opinions of Fish and Richardson and is also not intended to address every court or case situation. So just um, the next slide, um, this is Jamie Partridge, I am a principal in the Houston office of Fish and Richardson, and I um, do primarily or all intellectual property litigation. And then I'm going to let my co-presenter, Christina, briefly introduce herself as well. Hi everyone, I'm Christina Brown Marshall, and I'm a principal in the Atlanta office. And my practice is kind of split. I do both patent litigation and also product liability related litigation. Okay, so now we'll turn to general considerations. And um, so let me just go over some of the things that we're going to cover today. I am going to do an overview of the law and also touch on a, um, some of the corporate codes of conduct. Um, then Christina is going to discuss the, pro the professional obligations that as attorneys, you also have to abide by during negotiations. After that, as I mentioned, we're going to have some hypotheticals where we, we try to apply these principles. These principles sound pretty black and white, but then of course we all know that life is gray. And so that's why we have these hypotheticals so that we can figure out um, or we can apply these principles. Um, we'll talk basically about what these rules permit, what they prohibit, what are some of the consequences of unethical our unlawful behavior, and also um, the benefits of behaving eth ethically in negotiations. Because I'm kind of a carrot person instead of a stick, I like to start <clears throat> with the next slide about why should we be ethical in negotiations? Um, you know, first, it's not on the slide, but it helps you sleep better at night, I think. Um, and it also makes you uh, feel like you're a nice or good person. But again, um, here's the stick part, there are consequences. Um, the law, and we'll talk about this, imposes penalties for dishonesty. And on top of the law, lawyers have additional professional obligations. Uh, and there are consequences, as we all know, to violating an ethical, uh, attorney ethical, requirement. And then corporations have codes of conduct. And some of these codes of conduct are pretty strict. They may be even stricter than uh, what the law or the rules of professional responsibility require. 
And as you'll see, there are some consequences there. Probably the most um, beneficial reason, or I always think so, is your reputation depends on your being uh, reviewed as, um, your reputation depends on you being viewed as ethical. And so um, I think that's one of the most important things that no one should ever underestimate. So let's turn to some of the legal principles that inform the conduct allowed <clears throat> and not allowed during negotiations. Um, so the next slide is uh, we're going to just do overview of tort law. Um, and we're using the restatement. I always tell, I think I told everyone, you know, I was hoping I'd never have to look at a restatement again after law school, but here we are. And of course, we're using it as a proxy for all the state laws because the restatement, of course, sets out the general legal concepts. And the restatement second of torts, um, section 525, 525, um, makes it, uh, if you are in a negotiation and you fraudulently make a misrepresentation, then you may be subject to liability. Now, the misrepresentation under tort law can be one of fact, opinion, intention, or law. And what's interesting here is the first introduction, because you'll see a schema throughout these, um, throughout these laws and rules that are often broken up by fact and law. But also here, uh, the restatement of torts talks about uh, opinion and intention as well. And uh, there has to be justifiable reliance, and it has to be for the purpose of inducing the other person to act or not act in reliance upon the misrepresentation. So, uh, and um, also, if you look here, this is an assertion or an intentional act. We'll see as we walk through these that there are also in certain circumstances um, consequences for making, for not making a statement, for non-disclosure when you should. And um, that is mainly going to be, um, it's more codified in contract law. That's the next slide um, where we look at the restatement of contracts. And um, uh, this is a certain provisions, there are certain provisions in the restatement of contract that uh, address these circumstances, inform the circumstances when you're negotiating. Um, and section 161 talks about that there are certain circumstances where non-disclosure is equivalent to an assertion. And when that happens, then you fall back into all the provisions that prevent a fraudulent or material assertion that is um, incorrect or false. And so there are certain circumstances where withholding information as opposed to actually making a statement is actionable. Section 162, we'll look through this and it'll tell you the circumstances in which there is a fraudulent or material misrepresentation. And then 164 is talking about consequences. When is a contract voidable because of a misrepresentation? So let's turn to section 161. This is the non-disclosure provision. Um, and there are certain circumstances, like I said, when non-disclosure is equivalent to an assertion. And a non-disclosure of a fact, and that's again, you see the hierarchy again, this is fact, not law, it's discussing fact. Um, if you do not disclose a fact when you know that the disclosure of the fact would correct a mistake of the other party. And, and here's a materiality that's, that's in this um, section, as to a basic assumption and if the non-disclosure of fact amounts to a failure to act in good faith. So the law punishes non-disclosure of facts if the facts are material, to the agreement and they amount to failure to act in good faith. Now let's turn to um, section 162, which discusses um, 
um, misrepresentation and when it is a fraudulent or material. So now we're moving back into uh, an assertion. So this is when you are making a statement versus not disclosing it. Although we saw earlier that sometimes non-disclosure can be equal to an assertion. And um, first there's an intent element. So the first uh, prong here is fraudulent. And the intent, if you intend your assert assertion to induce a party to agree to your side of the contract. So um, the first, the first um, element would be if, if you know or believe that the assertion is not in accord with the facts, very high level um, um, circumstance would be if you're selling a car and you say the car was never in an accident and that's just not true. So that's a pretty easy, you know, more black and white example. Um, another one is if you don't have the confidence that you state or imply. So I'm 100% confident that this car has never been in an accident. And you don't know because maybe you purchased the car from someone else. Um, and so, you know, you're not meeting the standard of what you're making in your misrepresentation. And um, third, knows uh, if you know that you do not have the basis that you state or imply for the assertion. I've checked all the records and the car has never been in an accident. Well, if you didn't check all the records, um, then you don't have the basis that's required for that um, statement. The other prong is if a misrepresentation is material and it's material if it would likely induce a reasonable person to manifest his, extent, uh, his assent to the agreement or it's likely to induce the recipient to do so, the other party. So let's turn to consequences again. Um, section 164, when this um, talks about that, if you make a fraudulent or a material misrepresentation and you, the other party justifiably relies on that, then the contract is voidable consequences. So let's turn now just very quickly to a couple of codes of conduct by corporations, because I think this is also something that you need to keep in mind. Um, the corporation may have a code of conduct and sometimes, um, you know, they're not as explicitly written as the law. So they may have higher requirements. For instance, I look at Levi Strauss and company, honesty, we will not say things that are false. We will never deliberately mislead. Arguably, there's no materiality requirement like there often is under the law and the ethics rules. So, um, you know, I, I think there probably is reasonably, but um, we need to keep in mind that some of these corporations' uh, code of conduct may be very high. We will be as candid as possible, openly and freely sharing information as appropriate to the relationship. So arguably there could be um, a materiality factor there, but I just wanna point out that, that codes of conduct of corporations sometimes are very strict. ADP, um, associates are expected to be honest and ethical in dealing with each other, clients, vendors, and all other third parties. So this, this is more in line with, you gotta follow the ethical obligations in the law, of course. Doing the right thing means doing it, doing it right every time. That seems very strict to me. Um, but um, there, and they also, ADP says there's zero tolerance of non-compliance and that any violations will result in swift progressive discipline, including possible termination of employment. So again, there are consequences for, um, for not following these rules and the law, of course. Um, and then in addition, as we, as I touched on earlier, your reputation, not only is it just important to you, you know, I think as a, a good person, but it's important because the legal community is fairly small. And if you get a reputation of sharp practice, you know, then um, it could affect ongoing relationships between companies. Uh, and that's the next slide, please. Um, especially if you are negotiating for the company. It could affect the terms on follow-on deals. I mean, if you if 
some of these are violated and the other company may not be as amenable to dealing with you in the future. Um, job opportunities and the ability to create new business relationships. I mean, these are more personal, but again, it's your reputation and whether people want to work with you um, in situations involving, um, you know, honesty and fairness. So, and now as an attorney, you have even more um, requirements and Christina is going to go through the professional obligations as attorneys. Thanks, Jamie. So Jamie's walked you through the obligations that kind of apply to all of us, whether or not we're an attorney. But if we are an attorney, we have this extra layer of professional obligations, and those are going to be set by each state's rules of professional responsibility. If I can get the next slide, please. So we have folks on the webinar today who are from many different states. So we're not going to be able to focus on any specific state. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus on the ABA model rules of professional conduct. And these are sort of a good baseline. Um, many states follow these rules or specific rules verbatim. Other states have sort of modified the rules a little bit. So what we're going to do is we're going to focus our discussion on the model rules and we'll try to point out some interesting variations that states have introduced along the way. So you can kind of get an idea for the flavor of some of the different um, the different ranges of rules that there are around these negotiation focus rules. So the first rule we're going to take a look at is Rule 4.1, and this sets the rules for truthfulness and statements to others. So an attorney, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly, and that's an important term, a make a false statement of material fact or law to a third person, or B, fail to disclose a material fact to a third person when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by a client unless disclosure is prohibited by Rule 1.6. Um, so there's some important wrinkles in here that we're going to want to talk about. So we need to kind of think about this as you kind of need to sort if you're looking at an issue, if you're looking at a representation that, that you have made or are considering making, um, you need to slice it up a couple different ways to really figure out what your obligations are with respect to that representation. So the first slice you want to make is you need to think about, is this a material fact or is this a statement of law? Because your obligations are going to be different depending on whether it's a material fact or um, a statement of law. The other way you want to slice it, too, is you need to think about what type of representation is it. Um, so I, I kind of like to think about these of, it, would it be a sin of omission or a sin of commission? So Section A kind of deals with those sins of commission. So this is you're making an affirmative statement. Um, and if you do, it can't be a false statement if it has to do with material facts or law. Um, on the other side, where you have sort of the sin of, of omission, that only applies to the material facts. Um, you, you do not have an obligation to inform the other side in a negotiation about what the law means or what the law says, um, but you may have a duty to disclose a material fact in certain circumstances. Um, and like I said, this is, this is the model rule. So this is what most states have adopted, but there are a few wrinkles. Um, one thing that's interesting to point out, so California only recently adopted Rule 4.1, um, but it also adds an extra layer of prohibition that comes out of its professional and business code. Um, Georgia has, has adopted Rule 4.1, but they have added um, a qualifier on there that the maximum penalty for a violation of the rule is disbarment. So this is a serious rule. Um, hey, Jane, I think you have an email up and you take that down, thanks. Um, so this is a serious rule with some serious consequences. So it's definitely something that you want to think about and you want to apply correctly when you're thinking about making a representation in a negotiation. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the one of those interesting and important slices that I talked about making is you have to figure out if you know this representation that you're considering is it a material fact. Um, and one of the things that you can think about is that you know this this statement that you could potentially make um, you need to think about whether it's actually an a material sort of important statement in the context of the negotiation or is this puffing 
um, and this is kind of a term of art that the, the ABA has addressed, um, you know, is this something that's just in the context of the specific circumstances of the negotiation, is it not generally taken as a statement of material fact? So some examples of this, um, the estimates of price or value placed on the subject of a transaction, that's generally not taken to be a material fact. Um, a party's intentions as to an acceptable settlement of a claim, again, that's not usually seen, that's more that falls into more of this puffing category. Um, the existence of an undisclosed principle generally is not considered a material fact, except in the, the, uh, the limited instance where non-disclosure of the principle would constitute a fraud. Um, so if you get the next slide, please. So we know that, um, that puffery is not considered a material fact, but what would be some good examples of what would be a material fact? So um, it would be unacceptable to make a false statement um, of material fact about something like a lawyer representing the other side that some something that they were negotiating about negotiating about some sort of benefit would cost the company money when it really doesn't. That would be a, an unacceptable false statement of material fact. Um, another instance would be saying that you don't have the authority to settle for a certain amount or that it's, your ability to settle is somehow limited when it's not. That would be a false statement of material fact. Um, next slide, please. So those were those were making affirmative statements of false fact. Now we're going to switch over to this uh, sort of our sin of omission and think about when do you have a duty to to disclose. So the comment to Rule 4.1 says that although a lawyer may be required to be truthful in dealing with others, a lawyer generally has no affirmative duty to inform an opposing party of relevant facts. Um, so an example of this would be. You don't have to tell the side, the other side in a negotiation, what your settlement authority is. That's on the sort of the thinking about this as a, as a sin of omission. But on the flip side, remember, if you do tell them what your settlement authority is, so if you're, you're making an affirmative statement, you have to, that statement has to be correct. Um, so again, we, we need to think about this and, and sorting this into the buckets of, you know, fact and law, omission and commission. Um, next slide, please. So these can be kind of tough calls, and, and these types of you know decisions about whether this is a material fact that you're, you're in the representation that you're considering making, it's going to depend a lot on the circumstances. Um, one of the things that you need to think about is the sophistication of the parties um, and what sort of access to information do they have. So you can think about if you're in a negotiation where you have two very sophisticated companies, each represented by a team of lawyers. Both sides are going to be very aggressive in obtaining information. Um, you know, they're going to be disclosing documents to each other. They're going to be going through this with a fine tooth comb. They're going to be asking the right questions because they know the types of information that they need to make an informed decision about a negotiation. That's going to be different if you have, let's say, on one side, you know, a very sophisticated company. On the other side, maybe an individual or a, a smaller company that's not as sophisticated. In that case, the other side may not be asking the right questions. So you withholding that fact, um, it may become more important and it may be more impactful and that may become more of an issue because they, they just don't know to ask the right questions to get those facts. Um, so that's something that you're going to want to think about when you're, you know, when you're considering um, whether or not you're going to reveal a fact in a negotiation. And we'll, we'll put this into practice when we get later when we get into our hypothetical, so you can kind of think about that in context. Um, so with that caveat that, you know, circumstances are always important, when it comes when it comes down to a close call, if it's a close call about whether or not it's a material fact that, that you need to disclose, courts tend to lean towards disclosure. So um, on this slide, we've got a list of cases. So these are cases where the court found that, that this information should have been disclosed. Um, and some of the examples of these are you know, the death of a client, misrepresenting settlement terms, changes to the terms of a contract or settlement agreement, um, statements that were true when made but are now false. So that was actually, we got a question. Um, someone asked earlier about what if things change during a discussion? So I think that that would be something where we would apply our rubric and we would say, 
well, it was true when I made it, but now there's been a change. So do I have to tell them, you know, that this change has occurred? And I think you would, you would go through that, that same thinking about, you know, is this a material fact? Am I required to disclose it? And I think that, you know, if it's an important fact, if it, if it is material, then you probably would be required to disclose it. Okay, uh, next slide, please. So mentioned that when we were looking at rule 4.1, that, that one of the requirements is that the statement needs to be made knowingly. So knowingly in that context, denotes actual knowledge, um, and the actual knowledge of the attorney can be inferred from the circumstances. So one thing to think about this, it doesn't require that you have to have evil intent. Um, you don't have to be actively, you know, attempting to conceal this fact. If you know, but if you know that, that um, the statement that you made is false, these, these rules are still going to apply. Um, the other instance where this might come into play, um, sometimes you just don't have enough information or you have the incorrect information and you think that a, that a statement is true when you made it and then you found out later that it wasn't true. In that case, um, you're going to need to correct the mistake by notifying the person of the misrepresentation as soon as you learn that it is you know, in fact, a false statement, um, even if that is opposing counsel, which that email would not be fun to send, um, but you need to do it and you need to rectify that. Okay, next slide, please. So let's say that you are in the position where you have a piece of information and you've, you've thought through rule 4.1 and, and you said, this is a material fact, and I, I've determined that I have a duty to disclose this. Um, this is going to come into tension sometimes with Rule 1.6, which Rule 1.6 covers the confidentiality of client information. So 1.6b says that a lawyer may reveal information relating to the representation of a client to the extent that the lawyer reasonably believes that, one, to prevent reasonably certain deaths or substantial bodily harm, or two, to prevent the client from committing a crime or fraud that is reasonably certain to result in substantial injury to the financial interest or property of another, and in further reverence of which the client has used or is using the lawyer's services. So you need to think about what are the implications of, of, of this disclosure? Um, am I required to disclose this even if my client doesn't want me to disclose this? So let's say that you determine that, you know, under four, Rule 4.1, that you're, you are obligated to disclose this piece of information, and you go to your client, and you say, my professional responsibility obligations require me to disclose this. May I disclose this fact? And the client says no. Um, and I, if you do that, and if you look to this rule and you think about it, you really are obligated to disclose this. So if it comes down to it, and this is a really hard decision to make, um, it might require you to withdraw from representation. If it came down to it, if it was, you know, to the, uh, to the, to the most serious implication. So that's a tough call to make. Um, and that's something that we'll need to think about. Um, and we'll, we'll talk about this a little bit more when we get to our hypotheticals. So finally, just a sort of an umbrella rule. Um, last slide, please. Rule 8.4. Just a reminder that um, it is professional misconduct for a lawyer to engage in things such as dishonesty, fraud, deceit, or misrepresentation. So this is always going to be sort of an overarching obligation that you need to keep in mind um, when you're considering, a, you know, what your ethical obligations are in a negotiation. Okay, so that's sort of an overview, and that's going to be our rubric for thinking about, um, you know, what our ethical obligations are in the negotiation. And we, what we'd like to do now is we'd like to talk through some hypotheticals to try to apply that rubric um, and ask you guys some questions. And we've given this talk before, um, and it's always interesting to go through these. It's really great when we can get the audience to participate because there's always new and interesting facts and wrinkles that, that people think of that you know we haven't thought of before when, when we've looked at these. Um, so what we're going to do, what our process is going to be for doing these hypotheticals is um, we'll present the, the issue. So we'll give you a little scenario with some facts. 
and we're going to ask a question and we're going to open up a poll that's going to allow you to vote. So you, you'll get a little bit of time to, you know, think about the situation, kind of think about the question, and then we would ask you guys to vote. And most of them are yes or no questions. So we'll, we'll let you all vote. Um, we'll close the poll and then every, we'll pop up the results so that everyone will get to see, um, how everyone voted. And what we'd like to do is we'd like to open it up once we see the results. Um, we'd like to open it up and get some volunteers. So if you voted no, can someone volunteer to let it explain your reason for why you voted no? Um, and if you go into your audio tray, sorry, not the audio tray, the attendees tray, um, you'll see that there's a little symbol with um, what looks like a, a little hand. That's your raised hand feature. So if you'd like to um, volunteer, you know, maybe give a brief explanation for your reasoning or just, you know, a quick reason why you, you thought it was a yes versus a no, just click on that raised hand and we'll we'll pick a person at random. Um, and Jane is going to open up your mic. You'll get a little a little window will pop up with a request to unmute. So at that point, you can unmute yourself and, and kind of share what your thoughts are on that. Um, and that way we can try to get some folks involved in the conversation. Um, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jamie to go through our first hypothetical. And hi, um, this is the first hypothetical, but first um, there was a question about whether codes of conduct must be written. Uh, I, I certainly believe that if a company is going, uh, if wants to enforce a code of conduct, it should be a written code of conduct. Um, of course, um, if you're an attorney and uh, you would be subject to attorney ethical obligations, regardless of whether there is a code of conduct. And um, also as a person, you would be obligated under the law during your negotiations, which we discussed earlier. So I certainly think if you're a corporation, it's great to have the code of conduct um, written. And if you're an employee and the conduct is code of conduct is not written, then I think that is um, that would be a gigantic issue for the company. Um, okay, let me turn to hypothetical number one, um, your counterpart. So the other side in a negotiation. Um, the, your counterpart in a negotiation tells you from its own research, his own research, that he has determined that a continuation patent was never disclosed to a standards organization. You know this to be false because under the standard organization's disclosure rules, disclosure of one patent is deemed disclosure of the family of patents. Now, tactically, you may want to correct this mistake, but the question here is, are you required to do so? And if you will all vote yes or no on this, that would be great. Okay, so here's the answers to our poll. And it looks like 64% of you um, did not think that there was a disclosure required and 36% of you thought there was. And as usual, when you're applying a hypothetical situation, I think um, the answer is you're, you're all right because it depends. You are all right in your answer because it depends on the circumstances. Uh, for So basically, you have to dig down a little further. And let me tell you, um, you know, how I look at this. I kind of, I lean to the no as well. But the a couple of things that you would want to drill down on is, of course, if this is a fact versus law, 
then you have more requirements because if if there is a legal um you know a legal issue there are less requirements of disclosure of legal issues but you do need to look because i don't know if you remember and this is actually a non-disclosure uh issue so under tort it was talking about an assertion so that wouldn't apply but tort is where you know there's the very broad disclosure requirement when there's an assertion of law fact intention um so you don't I don't think you have to worry as much about that and then but there are some if you knowingly fail to disclose non-confidential material and objective fact upon inquiry from a third person during settlement negotiations there's at least one court who has held that that is improper and that's in new mexico um, under the ethical obligations if it's a legal issue um then no because under 4.01b that does not apply to correcting legal assumptions um, if this is seen as an objective fact then most state rules of conduct would require disclosure if it's material but there are some states who don't um, and then again we would have to look at contract law that we talked about earlier again if it's material uh, there are times when non-disclosure uh, of a fact is equal to an assertion and if that's fraudulent or material then you would have some liability here um, I, I can't tell from the hypothetical how material this is and also I think there's a question of whether this is fact or law and I lean toward it being a non-disclosure of the law and especially if you're two sophisticated companies negotiating, I think there's less um, risk here, or even uh, risk isn't even fair, less um, requirement of disclosure. But I will also tell you that if you're, if you have a tactical advantage or you have, or you're more sophisticated or your power in a negotiation is much higher and unbalanced and much higher than your, than the other side, then you need to err on the side of disclosure you need to be more careful and you need to err on the side of disclosure because that are that those are some of the things that courts look at as well now does anyone who voted no uh, want to talk and give your um, reasoning behind that What about yes? <laughs> Christina, you wanna to go to two? Yeah, let's start with hypothetical number two. Okay, so in hypothetical number two, you are about to close the sale of one of your client's properties to the local church for its construction of a new elementary school. The business person on the transaction calls you to congratulate you on working out a great deal. She then adds that it's a good thing that the company is selling the property because the internal compliance unit informed, informed her that unknown to corporate headquarters or the public, for the last five years, large quantities of highly toxic chemicals have been dumped on a regular basis on the property. So we're, this, is a, this is a little bit bigger hypothetical, so we're going to split this one into chunks. So our first question is going to be, is the fact that these uh, highly toxic chemicals have been dumped on the property, is that a material fact? So we'd like you all to weigh in and let us know, yes or no, do you think this is a material fact? Okay, so looks like overwhelmingly folks on the call feel like this is a material fact. Um, so someone who voted yes, could I get you to please raise your hands and maybe just let us know really quickly why you think this is a material fact.
Okay. Um, you know what you can also do if you are uncomfortable with raising your hand and speaking, you can also um, use the question function. So if you wanted to write a short blurb in the questions, just a, you know, a couple words about why you think that, yes, this is a material fact, you can also do that, too. That might be a little bit easier. Um, so we have someone weighed in thinking that toxic dumping could be a criminal act. That could be one thing, to, way to think about it. Um, right, someone pointed out that implies the buyer would say no to the deal. Um, right, so it's, it's, infecting, it's in affecting the intended purpose of the use of the property. Um, someone pointed out that it would affect the value of the deal. So these are all important factors that, that would really weigh into the church's consideration. Um, someone else pointed out that it's going to impose obligations on the church because they may have remediation problems. Um, someone else pointed out that the reliance problem. These are all, all great thoughts. Um, so for the folks who voted no, um, could you weigh in, either raise your hand if you want to speak, or maybe type something into the question feature about why you thought that this wouldn't be a material fact? So someone pointed out that it's buyer beware. So that's, that raises a really interesting point, and I think this goes back to what we pointed out earlier about considering sophistication of the properties. So I would probably say that it is a material fact and with the buyer beware point um i would think that you know we want to look at the sophistication of the party so you have with obviously a large company because you have headquarters and you know you're obviously a, a fairly large team um versus a church a local church um which you know you have to ask what is the sophistication level of this what sort of access did they have to the property you know, is this something where if they had an inspector come in, they could have seen it? Or is this something that you would only know if you were monitoring for something in a way that was, you know, not very public and not very easy, easy to determine? Um, so someone else pointed out about notice. And I think that goes back to the sophistication, too. Is this something that, well, in the hypothetical, it's that the public was unaware of it. So obviously, it's not something that, you know, was in the news or that, you know, EPA had some open public reporting about, but this is something that maybe only the company knew about um, and that it was sort of buried information. It was not information that would have been easily to, easy to access. Um, so, so I think that we're probably right on the fact that this is a material fact. So the next question I had, um, would your client be committing misrepresentation by omission if you didn't disclose this fact? So Jane, can we open up the next poll, please? Uh, so, Jane, can you, I think you're showing results, but we need to open up the poll um, so that people can weigh in. Okay. So looks like that poll is not working. Sorry, guys. Um, so why don't we use the question feature? We, we're having a little bit of a, a wrinkle with the poll. Um, so do you think your client would be committing rep misrepresentation by omission? Um, any folks that want to weigh in? Um, so someone pointed out that the seller disclosures might include this might require the disclosure of this type of information uh, we got a vote for yes that it is committing misrepresentation by omission um folks voting so yes it's a material fact that it should be disclosed um yes unless they investigated the truth of it themselves um again i think this goes back to um to an access to information issue uh, if this is something that only your client knew about and the other side really couldn't obtain that information and it's 
you know, it's, it's a very critical piece of information going to the church's decision, right? So they specifically said that this is going to be used to build a new elementary school. So the presence of a highly toxic chemical is going to thwart that purpose. It's going to be unusable for the purpose in which they intend. Um, so I think that I would agree that you would be committing misrepresentation by omission if you didn't disclose this. Um, someone else pointed out that you, you may not be obligated, but you might want to because you will probably get sued. And that is also a good point. Um, so last question. So let's say that you determine, okay, this is, uh, this would be misrepresentation by omission. Um, I'm obligated to disclose this. You go to your client and ask them, you know, will you let me disclose this fact? And they say no. What would you do? What do you think your, your obligations would be at that point? Okay, and it looks like we've got, uh, no, so Jane, I think that's the poll for the next hypothetical. Um, okay, so let's, I think this is, it. so Jane, can you go ahead and stop that, that poll? I think that one goes to hypo, the next hypothetical. Um, so it looks like people are voting in the questions, which is great. We really, really appreciate your participation in this. Um, everyone's saying that they would withdraw. Um, does anyone think that you have the ability to disclose? Uh, someone pointed out about criminal dumping. Um, well, we want to think about this in the context of of Rule 1.6. So we do have some votes, but yes, you should disclose this information. Um, so remember, we talked about Rule 1.6. So you may reveal confidential information to the extent that you reasonably believe it's necessary to prevent certain death or substantial bodily harm or um, substantial injury to financial interest. So I would say that, you know, this in this hypothetical, you could actually have both of those, right? Um, potential harm to individuals, someone pointed out, the children at the school could be harmed by this. It's a highly toxic chemical. So that could be bodily harm to the children. Um, you could also see that it could be harm to the financial interests of the church, too. Um, they're investing in this property to build the school. So, you know, if they build this, you know, nice new elementary school and then find out somewhere down the road that they can't use it, because of the presence of this chemical that the, the company dumped there, then that's going to harm the financial interests of the church. So I, I think that probably you would be allowed to disclose. But again, you know, if if it comes down to it and you are put in a, a place where you have to choose, you know, withdrawal is also an option. Okay. All right. So that's hypothetical two. I'm going to hand it back to Jamie for hypothetical three. Okay, um, apologize for the technical issues. Um, I'm gonna to try to see in a minute if you can raise your hands and if you can, I want you to um, answer um, some of these. Also give me your thoughts in the questions section. But hypothetical number three, you are negotiating settlement of a breach of contract action your company brought against a supplier. And you truthfully say, so here we have an assertion that's truthful, five major customers canceled their purchase contracts after the other parties breach. Um, but you know that they canceled for reasons unrelated to the breach. So you've got a truthful statement, but there's some implication there, arguably. So uh, we're gonna do a poll and is disclosure required in this situation?
So, so this was more what I expected a little bit on this one because I actually go both ways. No, 53% of you say no, and 47% of you say yes. So does someone who voted no, or you wanna start with no and explain it either in the question section or raise your hand? Um, I would love for someone else to speak, but um, if not, Christina and I will just do it. So um, that's a good that's a good point. Um, we're assuming that the parties are of equal sophistication. Although I, I might imply into this that a supplier might be in a less um, balanced situation. It just depends. You're right on the parties. Um, the other party certainly could have asked some questions on this. So I think the the issue there is. Um, you know, whether or not, if they ask, um, whether or not you're required to explain any of this. Um, and arguably, it could be a non-material fact. So so where I go on the no side is that it could be seen as puffery. Um, and remember when we talked about it um, before, uh, puffery is okay. So what about the yeses? Why do you think that disclosure is required? Yeah, and, and I agree. I think there is an implication. Um, someone came in that I, I think there's a strong implication and there might have been some bad intent on the part of the person making it. Of course, if it's any of us, there's no bad intent. Um, and also, uh, th I mean, th th it could be not material um, and we just don't know in this situation. Uh, I think the implication is certainly that they settled because of the defendant's um, because of the defendant's breach, and um, there might be some disclosure under the ethical obligations. And especially if you're in New Jersey, you might check that. Um, and and New York or Texas, probably not. California, probably not. But let's see. Um, uh, it's always good not to make the statement if you don't. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think actually whoever said that is really hits on it. Why are you making this statement if there's no causation between it? So then there's an implication of causation and arguably that's that's bad intent. I mean, I don't see another reason you would make that statement other than trying to lead the person into uh, the agreement. So. Thank you so much. I may have missed some of your um, comments, but I do think this kind of falls on both sides, especially can, um, when you look at more circumstances. Okay, Christina. Okay, next hypothetical. So while reviewing documents to produce, oh, can I get the next slide, Jane, please? While reviewing documents to produce in response to a plaintiff's discovery request in a fraud case, you find emails between the sales representatives joking about the lies they told the plaintiff. But before you produce the emails, plaintiff's counsel calls you to say that his or her elderly client has no real recollection of the sale and would be willing to go away for nuisance value. So in this circumstance, is disclosure required? Oh, this is a nice balanced one. We've got it running pretty much neck and neck between the no's and the yeses. Okay. So really is a balanced response here. So we're at 51% yes and 49% no. Um, can we get some folks to weigh in? So who on the, the folks who came down on the yes side, since the yeses came out on top, um, could you either raise your hand or put some comments in the question feature about why you think the disclosure is required in this circumstance?
Okay, so someone noted that the disparity of positions um, and what lies were told, so sort of the content about what was said in the emails. Um, there's a question about would not disclosing, would that violate discovery? So that's a good point. Got to keep in mind the context. So this is within the, the context of a litigation, and you're talking about production of documents and discovery. Um, someone asked whether it's, it depends on whether it's relevant to the reasons why the purchaser bought the product. So, you know, are these really materialized that the, the, the sales rep told or not? Um, we got some votes coming in for no. So how about some of the no's way in? Um, Someone point out that it's not required, that these emails would be um, in the patient's possession. I don't think that's quite right. So I don't think these are emails between the sales rep and the plaintiff. I think these are emails between two sales reps talking about what they said to the, the plaintiff. Um, <laughs> someone said they would withdraw because they don't want to work for a client like that. That's an interesting point. Um, so someone just pointed out the fact that, the, that these are lies. Um, but the emails are jokes that could be interpreted in context. Plaintiff does not have evidence otherwise. Um, so it's a close call, but here's how I would come out on this. So I would say, I would say that there is not a duty to disclose. And here's my, here's my thinking on this. Um, so you need to think about the context. So this is not a negotiation per se. This is actually in the context of litigation and in the context of discovery. Right. Um, so there are specific rules that govern document production. Um, and it sounds like that, you know, you were in the process of reviewing and potentially producing these documents. It, it doesn't say that there was an obligation that, you know, you made a representation to the other side. Like, yes, we will give you all of our sales reps emails by a certain date. But there was some sort of obligation that, that you're violating by not disclosing these to the other side. Um, so we're assuming that, you, that you're within the bounds of what you were supposed to do within those discovery ob obligations. Um, there's no obligation to provide opposing counsel a preview of the documents. You know, a counsel on the other side could have decided to wait and see what documents were produced before making a settlement offer. Um, and so they, you know, they are obviously represented by counsel who is advocating for their client. So that decision could have been theirs. Um, also, you have no knowledge of the plaintiff's memory or motives, right? So you're, the plaintiff's counsel is coming to you saying that, ah, they don't really remember and they'd be willing to go away for nuisance value. Um, you don't know if that's just puffery on his part. Um, it could be that he's found out that they're really, this wasn't material or some, there were some other circumstances that he's just wanting to get out with that nuisance value. Um, so, and I think you also have to depend on the fact that, you know, they presumably had enough information to file the suit when they brought it. Um, so the fact that, that these emails went back and forth between the sales reps, you know, should not affect that. And on the other side, counsel should have been, should have been looking out for them. Um, I know I, I kind of get, I point, those are kind of pointing out the fact that this is an elderly person. Um, might weigh into the consideration, but I think that if you consider all the facts and context, there probably isn't a duty to disclose this um, at that point. Okay, all right, so I think, well, we're actually almost done with our time. Um, we're right at 2.30. So Jamie, do you wanna just, should we just skip down to the conclusions? This has been really great. I'm glad you guys were able to to weigh in and so we could have a discussion about this. We have more hypotheticals um, that are in the slides. Um, you know, we're always happy to, if you guys want to take a look at those and follow up with questions about any of the specific hypotheticals, we'd be happy to answer those sort of afterwards. But I think we're going to have to wrap this up now um, just because of, of time constraints. Sure, so I'll start with the conclusion and then I'll go through this very briefly. Um, the first are red flags. Always remember this, degree of sophistication, if you're, uh, degree of disadvantage and the sophistication, relative sophistication between the parties. If you're the more sophisticated party or you're the more powerful party, you really need to think about it and err on the side of disclosure if there's any question. Again, 
Uh, the last one is pattern. So if you and the another company or another person have a pattern of disclosing everything or have a pattern of not disclosing anything, you need to keep that in mind because there might be some issues there, some estoppel issues if all of a sudden you you were disclosing things and you decide not to. So be careful in that situation. Um, some of the things you want to be careful of as a lawyer is you, there's a serious misunderstanding. It has your fingerprints all over it, um, either by action or inaction, and you were relied upon in the situation. Okay, if we could go to slide 37, please. So some things that you can think about putting into place as, as sort of ways to, um, you know, avoid any ambiguity and make sure that all parties understand where everyone is. Um, thinking about including things like a non-reliance clause, a merger clause, add conspicuous clauses on the topic just to make sure that you are sort of belt and suspenders and making sure that you're meeting all of your obligations. Um, also something like a written offer to inspect. Um, things like that just to make sure that the other side has the, that information that they need. Um, next slide, please. So finally, as a negotiator, you're presumed to know the rules, um, but when it comes down to it, a lot of these things are gray areas and, and folks can differ, um, but when in doubt, err on the side of disclosure and honesty. Also keep in mind that lawyers will be held to a higher standard, um, and courts are not very forgiving of dishonesty and deceit. So again, you're gonna wanna err on the side of, of, uh, of disclosure and honesty. And finally, next slide. Just remember, there is a thing called karma, and what, what you put out there comes back to you. So uh, just keep that in mind in, in, as you go forward with your negotiations. Um, last slide, please. So that's, that's all the time we have for today. We really thank you everyone for attending today, and thank you everyone for jumping in on the questions and weighing in with your thoughts. Um, that always makes the presentation much more interesting uh, and much more exciting when we get folks to participate and, uh, and, and join in the discussion. So um, if you'd like to listen to the recording, we're gonna post an on-demand replay at fr.com. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to submit them via the question function or to send either Jamie or myself an email. We're happy to follow up by email afterwards. Um, if you have any questions about CLE credit, um, you're going to want to email our, our FISH MCLE team at mcleteam at fr.com. And you can always visit the website fr.com for more information. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.